Hi, this is Tom from ZeroDefinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through primary sclerosing cholangitis. And you can find written notes on this topic at ZeroDefinals.com slash primary sclerosing cholangitis or in the gastroenterology section of the ZeroDefinals medicine book. Let's jump straight in. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is a condition where the intrahepatic and the extrahepatic ducts become strictured and fibrotic. So if we look at the name, sclerosis means stiffening or hardening, and cholangitis refers to inflammation of the bile ducts. So this is stiffening and hardening of the bile ducts and inflammation of the bile ducts. And remember that the bile ducts are responsible for taking the bile that's produced in the liver down that small tube that we call the duct and into the intestines. When we talk about strictures, we mean narrowing, and when we talk about fibrosis, we mean hardening. So this narrowing and hardening of the bile ducts causes an obstruction to the flow of bile out of the liver and into the intestines. Now chronic obstruction of bile eventually leads to a back pressure of bile into the liver, causing liver inflammation, which we call hepatitis, which leads on to fibrosis of the liver tissue, and then ultimately liver cirrhosis. The cause is mostly unclear, although there's a, probably a combination of genetic, autoimmune, intestinal microbiome, and environmental factors. And we know there's a well-established link between ulcerative colitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. And this is quite a common question in the exams. So if you spot a patient who has ulcerative colitis in your exams, and they start to have liver symptoms and signs, think about primary sclerosing cholangitis. In fact, about 70% of cases of primary sclerosing cholangitis are associated with already established ulcerative colitis. So what are the risk factors? Well, the common patient that you'll see coming up in your exams is a male patient aged between 30 and 40 years old who already has ulcerative colitis and may even have a family history of primary sclerosing cholangitis. How do patients present? Often they present with jaundice, chronic right upper abdominal pain, pruritus, which is itching, fatigue or just general tiredness, and hepatomegaly on examination. If they've developed cirrhosis, then you might find other signs of liver cirrhosis. So a patient comes in who has a typical presentation of primary sclerosing cholangitis. You decide to do some liver function tests. Let's talk about what they might show. Well, liver function tests typically show what we call a cholestatic picture. And this basically means a picture on the liver function test that suggests cholestasis or slowing of bile duct flow through the bile ducts. And what this means is the alkaline phosphatase is typically the most deranged LFT and maybe the only abnormality that you find on the liver function test at first. Then there may be a rise in bilirubin as the strictures become more severe and prevent bilirubin from being excreted through the bile duct. Then the other liver function tests, so the transaminases, ALT and AST, will also become deranged, particularly as the disease progresses on to hepatitis. Let's talk briefly about autoantibodies. There's no antibodies that are specific or sensitive to primary sclerosing cholangitis, so they aren't typically very helpful in establishing a diagnosis, but they can indicate where there might be an autoimmune element to the disease that might respond to immunosuppression. Antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, or PANCA for short, is raised in about 94% of cases. Antinuclear antibodies, or ANA, are raised in about 77%. And anticardiolipin antibodies can be up in about 63%. To establish a diagnosis, the gold standard investigation is an MRCP which is short for Magnetic Resonance Cholangiopancreatography. And this involves doing an MRI scan of the liver, bile ducts and the pancreas. And in primary sclerosing cholangitis, it might show bile duct lesions or strictures. 
There's a few associations and complications that it's worth being aware of. Whenever you have pathology in the bile ducts, you're at risk of something called acute bacterial cholangitis, which is infection in the bile ducts. Cholangiocarcinoma, or cancer of the bile ducts, develops in about 10 to 20% of cases. It's associated with colorectal cancer. That hepatitis can lead on to cirrhosis and liver failure. You typically get biliary strictures that lead to the cholestasis and the damage to the liver. And you can get deficiencies in fat-soluble vitamins because if the bile isn't getting to the intestines, it can't help with fat digestion and absorption into the gut. So those fat-soluble vitamins can become deficient. So what's the management? The only curative option is to do a liver transplant. But the problem with liver transplant is it comes with its own associated problems. For example, only around 80% of people with a liver transplant survive five years after the transplant. An ERCP, which we'll talk about shortly, can be used to dilate and stent any strictures. A treatment called ursodeoxycholic acid can be used and may slow the progression of the disease. A medication called cholestyramine, which is what we call a bile acid sequestrate can be used to bind to that bile acids and prevent it from being absorbed into the gut and this helps to settle down the pruritus that's caused by elevated bile acids in the blood and then we need to monitor these patients for any complications such as the cholangiocarcinoma the cirrhosis and the complications of cirrhosis so like i said let's talk about the ercp procedure And this stands for Endoscopic Retrograde Cholangiopancreatography. And basically it involves inserting a camera through the person's throat, esophagus, stomach and then into their duodenum. And then in the duodenum there's a point where the bile ducts empty into the GI tract. So this is the point where the tube that comes from the liver, called the bile duct, joins with the duodenum and the bile acids join with the food travelling through the GI tract. The actual opening of the bile duct into the GI tract is called the sphincter of Oddi and as they go through the sphincter of Oddi with the endoscope they enter into the ampulla of Veta and then from the ampulla of Veta they can then enter into the bile ducts and use x-rays and inject contrast to identify any strictures or pathology in those ducts. If they find a stricture, then during the same procedure, they can dilate that stricture and put a stent in. And that can really improve the flow through those ducts and cause a dramatic improvement in symptoms. So the ERCP procedure can be quite helpful in these conditions. So thanks for watching, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget there's plenty of other resources on the Zero to Finals website, including loads and loads of notes on various different topics that you might cover in medical school with specially made illustrations. There's also a whole test section where you can find loads of questions to test your knowledge and see where you're up to in preparation for your exams. There's also a blog where I share a lot of my ideas about a career in medicine and tips on how to have success as a doctor. And if you want to help me out on YouTube, you can always leave me a thumbs up, give me a comment, or even subscribe to the channel so that you can find out when the next videos are coming out. So I'll see you again soon.